Thank you, Kale. Thanks for having me. Uh, again, I'm Nick Veronico. Uh, these books kind of represent uh, a, a huge part of my life. Uh, almost everyone I met or I know is from aviation. A lot of you guys are here. Uh, I started out in 1989 going to a couple wrecks with a friend of mine, Ed Davies, who's here. Uh, from there, we did wreck chasing, and then we did wreck chasing two, and uh, recently I did hidden warbirds. And one of the things, uh, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm more of a historian by training. I'm a, a journalist, I specialize in aviation journalism. Um, right now I work at uh, NASA, and that's going to come back to the story a little bit later. Uh, through my journalism work, I met my wife. So if somebody said, uh, oh, my parents were pilots and my brother's a pilot. So if somebody said, take aviation out of your life, I'd be dead. So they're, they're wreck chasing. Wrecks are out there. They're still out there. There's a lot more to find. Everybody thinks that uh, this is wreck chasing. Put on your stonewashed jeans and head on out and find a completely intact airplane. Uh, the last day and a half, we've talked a lot about whole airplanes, spending millions of dollars to go find them. This, my talk's going to be a little bit more on history, history everyone can touch. Take your kids out and see it. Because to me, this is really what wreck chasing, arch aviation archaeology is about is doing the research. Uh, I've always said that uh, wreck chasing is 95% homework and 5% going out and doing it. Uh, we coined the term wreck chasing in about 1990 for looking at airplane wrecks, and I just can't uh, make the switch to call it anything else, so uh, wreck chasing it is for me. So wreck chasing is a lot of research. There's a picture of me at an F-86 site before I decided to color my hair. Uh, some friends of mine are digging up a P-38 engine uh, near Annapolis, California. And that's really what it is. It's a lot of fun. Who wreck chases? This is the Plains of Fame Betty Bomber. And that's what it looked like when they brought it out of uh, Indonesia. This is the Sikorsky S-43 that's at the Pima Air and Space Museum. Uh, when this was found, the fuselage was submerged. Uh, the wing was being used as a footbridge up in Alaska, and it was traded to the Marine Corps, and they brought it back, uh, restored it, or did some work, took it to Pima, and Pima finished it up. This is a B-24 that was a wreck in Alaska. Uh, the guy got a bunch of parts from a number of different wrecks. Uh, he got some parts from me out of my collection. And it's now on display at Hill. And up top, this is a Judy dive bomber in Indonesia. And it was parked right about here. And this is the Babo airfield. And you can see as the Japanese disused their airplanes or they weren't serviceable, they just pushed them into this wreck. Excuse me, into this. They pushed the wrecks into this ravine. Uh, over here, uh, there's a Tony fighter. Uh, this uh, lily was recovered and is in the Indonesian National Museum. And that's what the airplane looks like today. It's restored to a taxiable condition. Uh, the cost of rebuilding the, the main spar uh, was too much, but uh, originally it, it had an inline engine. They have the inline engine, but they uh, put a radial on it to reflect the Dash 3. This is still there. This is a B-18 Bolo that crashed on the big island of Hawaii. And it can be seen today. Uh, most of the major helicopter operators uh, on the Hilo side will take you to it. It's on private property. Uh, it's owned by a consortium. And one of the guys lives about 100 miles from me. And he's all, yeah, you can go out there, but there are lava tubes and crevasses and things that you can't see until you're down inside of them. Uh, it's, it had landed on top of the trees and eventually slid down 
uh, onto the side of this hill. And the owners left a rope so they could get up and down. And you can see how steep it is. The inside is fairly complete. It had the top turret. The top turret was uh, removed in the 80s by Gary Larkins and some other guys, and it's now on display at the Pima Air and Space Museum uh, underneath their B-18. Glacier Girl, six P-38s, two B-17s, 260 feet underneath the ice. Uh, we had touched on it uh, earlier in some of the talks, uh, the talk about north-south polar. Uh, Lou Sapienza. Uh, this is a photo that Lou took uh, from his expeditions to Greenland. He came back and decided to devote his life to recovering uh, airplanes and looking for MIAs. They got down and they, uh, they had to develop all the technology to get to this. They developed what they called the gopher, which was basically a plumb bob with uh, copper tubing on the outside that circulated hot water, and they drilled down to it. They got down, and then all of a sudden they realized they needed some specialized tools to recover the uh, P-38, so they sent back to the States, and uh, Gary Larkins and a couple guys came up and took it apart. It looks like it's in primo condition, but the ice had essentially twisted every piece over to the left by about five degrees. So they took, this was in the early 90s, they had to develop all the straightening techniques to put this airplane back together. And there it is today. This is one of my most favorite hidden warbird stories. Uh, there's a guy named Mike Couches, Mustang Mike. In the 50s, he was buying P-51s from McClellan Air Force Base for $750, flying them from Sacramento to Hayward in the Bay Area, giving them a quick IRAN, licensing them and selling them for $3,900. At uh, Hayward, where Mike is based, was the California Air National Guard. They were flying P-51Hs, and Mike really wanted a P-51H. So he started going to some of the salvage yards and buying P-51H parts. And this is an RF-6D, so a P-51D fitted for uh, reconnaissance. And there was one yard that had a bunch of P-51H parts, and it also had this Mustang in it. Someone had tried to export this illegally. It was dismantled. They caught it on the dock, and it ended up being sold surplus to the scrap dealer. So every time Mike went in to go buy P-51H parts, he had to walk by this, and he refused to buy it. And finally, the guy who owned the scrapyard said, I'm not going to sell you any more P-51H parts until you buy this. So Mike carts it home. He had it for a while. His kids played on the fuselage in their backyard for years. And in about 1966, he sold it to a guy in St. Louis. And the rumor had it after years that there was a Mustang in a garage but nobody could find it and nobody could figure out where it was. And a guy named Butch Schroeder, who uh, has owned a number of award-winning warbirds over the years, uh, he'd heard the rumor. He was invited to an air show uh, in St. Louis, which is where this is. And Schroeder said, I'll come to your air show if you take me to see this Mustang. He had no intention of buying it. He just wanted to see it. He got there. The uh, guy who owned the, the Mustang his wife was ready to have it gone. There were parts everywhere, and Schroeder was able to uh, make a deal, and if you're gonna buy a Mustang project in somebody's garage, you better have friends with pickup trucks. So they hauled it home, and that's what it looks like today, restored in Clyde East's markings as little Margaret. And when I say hidden warbirds are still out there, this is an F4U, uh, or excuse me, a Goodyear-built FG-1 uh, that was found in Palau about a year ago, uh, just off on one side of the uh, atoll. Nobody had any reason to go over there, and finally somebody was catching a fish or something and uh, stumbled upon this. After the war, uh, you could buy scrap airplanes. Uh, this 
P63 probably sold for $2,000, and it was bought by the Springs Amusement Park in, uh, I believe, North Carolina. And they had this, they had a uh, C87, a cargo version of a B24 they'd converted into a snack bar. And this was sitting uh, here. Kids could come up, play on it. Uh, this was until the 1980s. And this now flies as Pretty Polly with the Palm Springs Air Museum. This was a P-51A Allison engine powered with a scoop on top. It uh, was sold surplus, as I recall, out of Altus, Oklahoma. Went to Frederick, Oklahoma. Uh, put on a pylon. Sat there for about two years and someone who had the racing bug came by and bought it. This school building is still there today. The church has been torn down and redone. Uh, this plot of land is still open, but the Mustang's gone. And there it is today at the Yanks Air Museum. Another hidden warbird, hidden in plain sight. Bill Allman uh, found this. Dave Talashay had bought it from the Air Force. It's a P-51D, it had a tall tail. Uh, it served with NACA at uh, Langley doing dive tests. And Bill Allman bought it, uh, took it off the pole, was gonna convert it back into a stock P-51D. They got into the wings and the gun bays and they ended up being faced with all this NACA equipment. So instead of uh, making it a warbird, he put it right back into NACA configuration. And this was, before they had high-speed wind tunnels, they would put a wing shape or a fuselage shape out on the wing. And they had either cameras or strain gauges. This airplane had strain gauges. They take the airplane up to about 35,000 feet, dive it down, take the measurements, pull out, and do it again and again and again. And here on both sides of the wing it has little veins and those veins feed information into essentially a PDI so that the pilot as soon as they're centered they can then make the dive and that basically trues their data to make sure that the test is done properly and this airplane was restored by uh, Pacific Fighters Bill Musala who had also done uh, John Sessions' Impatient Virgin that we heard about this morning. This is Chris Prevost's P-40. Uh, it was on the uh, Iron Range in Northern Australia. And here it is. It was recovered, floated around Australia and New Zealand for a while. Someone spent about a million three U.S. dollars to reskin the fuselage, and then they ran out of money. Uh, the airplane was put in auction. Uh, Prevost was able to buy it. He didn't think he'd ever have enough money to own a Warbird, but uh, he was able to buy it. He was able to pick up the engine that went to it at the same time. And there it is today. A little personal story. This will feed back into some of the stuff I mentioned earlier. My mom's uncle, uh, Robert Woolfolk, was an Olympic class swimmer, was at UCLA, was gonna go to the uh, Olympics in 40. Of course, that didn't come off. He became a uh, bombardier with the 390th Bomb Group. Uh, he went overseas in May of 44. At that time, if you had made five combat missions, you were basically guaranteed to make your full 25 or 35 at the time and come home. And I started digging into the history. All, all we knew was that he was a swimmer and my mom thought he was handsome and he was a great guy. There were no pictures of him. And I found a, a gentleman over in Holland who had done some research on the uh, 376th mission. There's a picture of the nose art on their airplane. And on May 28th, uh, Decatur Deb was shot down by Staff Sergeant uh, Binseal. And here's a picture of him after the victory and he was flying a Folkwolf FW-190. 
here's the target. That day, each uh, squadron from the 390th lost two airplanes. So one of my hobbies, being an aviation journalist, I used to go around to all the junkyards and uh, see what there was for sale. And I had stumbled across uh, a couple things, and I decided that instead of collecting stamps and coins, I was going to collect aviation armament. And I had come across a B-17 tail turret. And it didn't look like this. The airplane it had come from had been on its ass. And uh, I had traded parts to the guy who had done the B-24 restoration and was extremely unhappy with what happened. And I work a lot at night. Uh, 2.30 in the morning, sometimes we get a break. And uh, I looked on eBay. And I've been to probably 120 airplane wrecks, a lot of them B-17s, looking for parts for this because married with a wife and a couple kids, uh, you know, spending a million dollars on an airplane part wasn't going to happen. So I've been to all these B-17 wrecks, could never find what I was looking for. 2.30 in the morning, I'm tired, my eyes hurt, my head hurts. I said, I'm going to take a mental break. I'm going to look on eBay. And on eBay were the skins, the pumpkin, the post, these parts, and the defroster that I needed for my project. I called my wife, who I met through aviation, at 2.30 in the morning and said, I'm going to max out the credit card. Click. And uh, a week later, a bunch of boxes showed up from uh, Alaska. And there's my B-17 tail turret being finished in Chino today. So chasing a wreck, you know, you don't have to have a bunch of money. You just have to have a desire and a little bit of patience. So this is a uh, Banshee F2H, I believe it's a Dash 4. A uh, friend of ours had taken thousands of airplane pictures while he was uh, in the service. He took two Banshee pictures, and this is the one he took, and I think this is at Kaneohe Bay. This airplane was coming from San Diego to Moffett Field. They got into some clouds and uh, caught a high tension wire and went down. Here's the record card. Uh, the record card gives you uh, when it was delivered, what squadrons it was with, uh, its final disposition. From the newspaper, uh, accounts, we were able to determine where the airplane went down, and this is the Saratoga Gap Open Space Preserve, and Seattle area is much like San Francisco. We have a lot of open space, uh, a lot of space that's devoted to parks and will never be built on, and we were able to determine that uh, the wreck was here, which is a five minute slide in and a four hour walk out. And here's the tail section, the wing box. And we were able to line up the bureau numbers on the airplane. If you want history, you can also go after uh, commercial aircraft. Uh, this was a, an F-27 uh, that crashed not too far from my house. And to do the research, we use you know, a, a simple fact sheet. We just write things down, keep track of our information. Uh, witnesses, very helpful. And if you're gonna go out, aside from having a hiking partner, uh, these are kind of some of the things you need. And there is an online community for wreck chasing that we started in 1995. It's got uh, these areas, uh, general po posts, resources, uh, it's a great place to learn about other wrecks, uh, see things that other people have found. There's an identification form. If you find something that you can't figure out what it is, post a picture and somebody will know. I'm going to go through a couple of uh, interesting wrecks not too far from me that uh, I wanted to share. This is the Ghost Blimp of Daly City. It comes up about once a year. Uh, on August 16th, 42, uh, Ernest Cody and Charles Adams uh, went out at Treasure Island. 
their normal base was at Moffett Field, which is in Sunnyvale at the bottom of the San Francisco Bay. And they went out with a flight mechanic. All three of them got on. The two lieutenants said, or the two officers uh, told the enlisted man to get off the airplane and the two of them were gonna take it out the bay. And this is L-8 bringing uh, parts out to the Doolittle Raiders when they were off the California coast. And it departed at Treasure Island at 6 o'clock in the morning to patrol outside the Golden Gate near the Farallons. At 7 o'clock in the morning, it flew past the Albert Gallatin, which was a uh, tanker going into San Francisco Bay, the Farallons in the background. Uh, the pilots of the blimp said they sighted an oil slick. The next thing anyone knew was when the airship hit the beach and dropped one of its depth charges. As soon as the depth charge came off, the airship became buoyant and it started to float uh, into town. There's nobody on it. It eventually crossed uh, over into Daly City and ended up here. The two pilots, the two crew were never found. And here's the roof line that we've matched up. So it's not a million dollars, but you can at least go out and touch history. You can take your kids out there. You can show them the then and the now. And here's the uh, other depth charge. Uh, the cabin door was open. And this uh, gondola car... Uh, went back into the Goodyear fleet, and it's now at the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola in their lighter-than-air display. BCPA, British Commonwealth Pacific Airlines, and William Capel, he was kind of the American Mozart. He had gone to Australia for a tour with his wife. He'd taken uh, the precaution of sending his wife home a week earlier just in case anything happened. The airplane was... Uh, flew, I believe, Sydney to Fiji to Honolulu, changed crews, came back, uh, typical cloudy day. They saw a break. We think that they saw a break in the clouds, decided they knew where they were and started to let down, and they hit the coast, uh, the coastal range right here. And this is probably only another eight miles to the airport. If they hadn't hit this peak, uh, right about here, there was a school. Here's a shot taken about two hours after the crash by a newspaper reporter. Uh, again, through contacting uh, people we could find in the newspapers, he was very helpful. And this is the open space trail map. Uh, this is the ridge line here. There's a Highway uh, 35 that goes uh, on the backbone of the San Francisco Peninsula. So the wing clipped and fell here. Uh, one of the wings, about 13 feet, fell off, and the airplane continued across uh, the point of impact. This vista point was, they took a dozer from the main road and cut a trail to the vista point, which is where the recovery operation uh, went from. Uh, this airplane wreck, a friend of mine, Ed Davies, he was talking to a gentleman at the camera repair shop and the guy pulled out some slides and said, hey, do you know what this is? And from the picture of basically three to four feet of the horizontal stabilizer, uh, Ed and I were able to figure out which airplane it was and start a map to go find this, S started looking at maps to go find it. A motorcycle club had owned this property uh, from the 50s until the late 80s before it was bought for a park. And they, uh, 1960s motorcyclists, had a little different sense of humor than us. Uh, we were told to continue down the trail until we found the mannequin arm in the tree, and that was where we would find the airplane. We had to hike over ridges and through all kinds of hell for years to get to this wreck. And then the uh, mountain bikers had an, uh, an argument with the people who owned the land 
because the landowners wanted to close some trails and the mountain bikers said, if you're going to close the trail, you have to open a new one for us. And the landowners said, oh, okay. And they built this trail right through the middle of the crash site. Uh, they even named it after the airplane that crashed. First, I was pretty upset about it. And then after I made the walk to it on the nice trail, I thought, well, this is pretty damn nice. And here's the section of wing and the debris field down below. Uh, Ed had gone to the National Archives and found a wreckage distribution map, uh, which would be a, a wonderful thing for an archaeologist. It was probably, I don't know, four foot square and had every little piece marked on it. This piece had uh, jammed itself in between two trees in a vertical position, so there was no weather action on the paint. And we always encourage people, if, you're gonna, if you find painted surfaces, turn them back over so that the next person can see it. The Philippine Clipper up in Ukiah, California, was again coming back from Hawaii. Uh, all of the West Coast was weathered in. They were going to go to Clear Lake to land. And we started doing our research, and we ran into this gentleman, Bo Hyatt, who, uh, as a kid, had heard the airplane come over his house and crash. And I learned a valuable lesson. Bo had the prop and the oil cooler. This is Elgin Long, who'd made a number of record around the world flights and had also written a book about searching for Amelia Earhart. So Bo was a good old country boy, and he said, Oh, yeah, my, my family owns a property right up to the crash site. And I thought, well, that's as good as a key to me. So he took us out there, and we started hiking down this, this ravine. We spent the day there, had a nice time, ate lunch, came back. And when we got to the top, there was a guy with a shotgun looking at us. And apparently, Bo didn't tell us that he had been having a feud with the neighbors, and they didn't like him on their property, and he didn't like them on their property, but they had to drive through his property to get to their property. And... Uh, that got my attention. Here's the Philippine Clipper in wartime. And again, this is the crash report from the Navy. It gives the uh, list of everyone on board, what their positions were. Uh, one of the engines. This is the uh, empennage. And through our association with looking for the Philippine Clipper, we were uh, able to get to, this is Clipper Cove in uh, Treasure Island. This was one of the last four-engine flying boats that's come through, although it came through on a barge. It's a short solent that was taken to the Oakland Aviation Museum. Another wreck we uh, looked for was this Flying Tigers Constellation. It took off out of San Francisco on Christmas Eve. Uh, the flight engineer uh, had volunteered to swap with the flight engineer who was man on the manifest uh, because the flight engineer on the manifest had kids and he thought that he should be home with his kids. They took off. The plane drifted to the left and hit one of the coastal hills. And surprisingly, there's still a number of pieces there. Uh, one of the things we learned with this crash was that uh, typos happen. And uh, like one of the early, I think it was Pete Merlin had said that they had the coordinates, they thought they'd just drive right to it. But we had the coordinates and we thought we'd drive right to it, but the coordinates, of course, put us about four miles across the valley on a different hill. And uh, through some friends of ours uh, with aerial photography, we were able to pull pictures around the, the time and by accident or good detective work, we were able to see the crash site on the opposite side. And this is probably one of the easiest wrecks to get to. It's 10 minutes out from uh, San Francisco airport. Another uh, 1950s midair that happened in Oakland. Uh, one of the airplanes crashed, the other one tailless made it uh, all the way over to, South, to San Francisco Airport. A newspaper photograph of the time, 
uh, fuselage, tail section. Uh, through our research, we ran into a guy who was in one of these cars with a bunch of Boy Scouts coming back from an outing when this happened. NACA P-51H. Again, these are all airplanes that we're mainly interested in, in uh, the history and documenting uh, the people who were on board the airplanes. Uh, NACA pilot Ryland Carter, uh, he was flying again uh, wing flow uh, tests. The airplane had models on, on the wing. Oh, here we go. So this is a, a B model Mustang with a forward swept uh, wing model. And here's the, the, the turning vanes from earlier. This airplane uh, came apart in the air. And this is the wreckage map uh, from the National Archives. And I thought, well, I know exactly where it is because there's Thornton Avenue and there's Blake Howe. And there's Bain, and there's the railroad, or the, excuse me, there's the railroad tracks. And there's the freeway that they put in, so it couldn't be that hard to find. But of course, they uh, changed the configuration of the railroad tracks and redid the streets since the airplane crash happened. They picked up as much as they could, took it back to uh, NASA Ames or NACA Ames and reassembled the airplane. And that's the crash site today. It's a DC-6 United airplane. It impacted right below this saddle and then continued on down the hill. This is Tolman Peak here. The Oakland Airport where it was headed is over here. And there's the, the first point of impact. It hit here and then went down into this gulch. There's the gully there. And 60 years later, there's still parts everywhere. This, another crash of a uh, Transocean DC-4 that had members of the 509th bomb wing on it. Uh, this is only about a mile in the flatlands from where the DC-6 crash happened. And we were able to take members of their family. Uh, the son of the pilot drove by this every day and had no idea that this is where his uh, father had crashed. And we were able to, again, use photos to line up the hills and the crash report to locate the area. And this is a consolidated PB4Y2 that crashed in San Diego. There were 740 built, but the Navy uh, only delivered 739, and I couldn't find out where that one airplane was. And again, through my work, I have a lot of time to sit in hotels and look at uh, information. So I'd gone to the National Archives and pulled the report. Here's a privateer in full combat dress. And then this is what it looked like when it came out of the factory. Uh, the nose turret and other modifications were done at Litchfield Park in Arizona. So the airplanes would come out, they would be flown by a contractor crew, delivered and accepted by the Navy and then flown for modification. And that's what happened with this airplane. It uh, took off out of San Diego. Here's Lindbergh Field. Took off. The outer wing panel came off. And then the airplane uh, continued to crash uh, shortly thereafter. So this is what I had. I started lining up the pictures with the current day maps. And it says Commander Cathcart's house and then location of the detached wing. So the location of the detached wing was easy to find. 
I went to uh, the, this gentleman's house, knocked on the door, said, hi, I'm going to talk to you about the airplane that crashed near your house. He said, oh, yeah, the wing hit the back of the house. I said, well, no, it hit the front. L let's go out and take a look. So I walked out in front with the man, and I showed him the picture. He looked at his house, and he starts screaming for his wife. And I'm all, oh, my God, what have I done? She comes out, and she starts screaming. Apparently, this hedge had been a bone of contention with these neighbors, and this picture with no house there showed that the hedge had been there first, and they had just solved years of feuding with their neighbor. So... Then I had taken this uh, picture and was able to figure out what street and what house, now that everything had been built up, uh, where this wreck was. And I thought, hmm, four in the afternoon on a Sunday, I don't know if I want to knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I'm going to go look at the airplane wreck in your backyard. So I sent my wife to knock on the door. And oddly enough, she got a really nice reception. And then I came out of the shadows and uh, came down here and was able to line up the terrain. And this gully little ditch thing here is right here where the wing was. Unfortunately, four uh, consolidated employees died in this crash. And here's the back area. I'm still able to uh, kick up parts. Uh, when they built these houses around this little bowl. Uh, everyone owns down to the bottom, uh, but no one can build back there, so the site is undisturbed. And this is what happened. There were supposed to be 122 bolts in the outer wing panel, and I think there were eight, and it just wouldn't stay in the air. This is a set R4D. Uh, the one that crashed was 17, I believe, 226. So this is a sister ship. I looked for this airplane for 12 years. Here's the crash report. Crashed in San Carlos, California. There were roughly 24 guys on. 16 of them survived. And I live in San Carlos, so how hard could it be? So in the newspaper uh, report, it said that the Army Dog Training Center, the men who were there were the first ones to respond to the crash. And I thought, well, how hard can it be to find the Army Dog Training Center? So I went to the local history museum, and they said, what Army Dog Training Center? So I knew a gentleman, Bill Carpentier, who had been an Army Dog Trainer at uh, San Carlos, and he sent me a map. And on the map, he had outlined where the dog training center was. And I laid the map down, called my wife in and said, hey, do you know where this is? And she said, yeah, that's the property I manage. So the dog training center has since been built up, but that didn't really impact me because uh, the airplane didn't crash there, but I knew that it had to be somewhere in this area. And you'll notice this is all open space and there's Big Canyon Park. Courtesy of uh, my favorite research site, eBay, I was able to acquire the negatives from the newspaper showing the airplane crash. And the park goes down here, and there's a street that I live on that's right here. And this is what it's like today. And a gentleman named Jeff Christner and his son Paxton uh, we'd gone up to this site a number of times, and they were the first ones to find parts of it. And Regent Court, right here, uh, they had taken heavy equipment up, dozed a road here, dozed down, and they removed the airplane wreck, and Regent Court is now because of that airplane crash. And you know you all want to go there and look for this airplane. It's my favorite. I still want to go and see that. So to recap, you can go out and touch 
history without a bunch of millions of dollars. It can be fun. It can be rewarding. Uh, there's a lot of homework involved in doing it. Uh, there's plenty of resources. There's a list of books uh, online. I have some that I highly recommend. Uh, hike with a partner and have fun. <laughs>